Hello, guys. So we are now today with Kain Warwick, who is the founder of uh, Synthetix. It's a uh, uh, Ethereum based uh, issuance uh, protocol for synthetic assets and uh, currently they support uh, synthetic uh, fiat currencies, uh, cryptocurrencies and commodities. Great to have you again here, Kain. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me again. So can you tell in simple words uh, for those ones who are not aware what synthetic is, uh, what it is and how it works? So synthetics basically um, generates a bunch of tokens that track the price of uh, real world assets or, or crypto assets. Um, so we have tokens that track Bitcoin, that track silver, that track gold, um, and, and a bunch of other things as well. Um, and basically what that lets you do is trade those assets on Ethereum. Um, so things that are not native to Ethereum. Um, and the way that that works is people uh, like other collateralized um, stable coins and, and other assets like that, they put collateral into a contract and then the uh, stable coins, these synthetic assets are issued against that collateral. And then there's a bunch of mechanisms that kind of keep things in check to make sure that uh, the price stays on peg. Thank you. And you were initially on Ethereum, but now you migrated to Optimism. And uh, can you tell us uh, why did you consider exactly Optimism as a layer to solution, not other chains? Yeah, I, I think, you know, um, we wanted to remain within the Ethereum ecosystem. And so within the Ethereum ecosystem uh, for scaling solutions, there are only a couple of paths, right? You can go optimistic rollups, um, you can go side chains, uh, you can go some of the zero knowledge solutions. Uh, but our view was that rollups were going to be um, at least, you know, for the next few years, probably the dominant solution. Um, and so we worked with Optimism very early um, to ensure that we had, you know, kind of access to uh, Optimism uh, when it launched as quickly as possible. And what are your thoughts on ZK rollups, by the way? I think they would be amazing if they existed. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, it's going to be a while, I think, before we have production ready um, zero knowledge rollups. Um, we have things like Starkware. Um, Starkware is mm -hmm. awesome, but Starkware has some pretty harsh trade offs when it comes to composability. Um, so, you know, I'm very excited, as everyone is, for when zero knowledge rollups are production ready, but we're not quite there yet. Do you think uh, you will uh, optimize, uh, you will use ZK rollups in future? I think everyone will use ZK rollups in the future. It's just a question of when, right? Um, you know, we need scaling now. Um, we need Ethereum to scale, uh, you know, years ago, let alone, uh, you know, right now, right? So um, we, need, we need tech that's ready to go. Um, and I think that for now, optimistic rollups are kind of the only um, choice for DeFi protocols that want to maintain composability, um, that want to you know, inherit the security um, profile of Ethereum, et cetera. So if you consider all of the trade-offs, I think that you know, it's, it's no question that optimistic rollups are the best solution right now. Yeah, this is true. And uh, talking about question of scalability, you initially started on Ethereum and uh, I guess you as well awaited uh, the merge and transition to proof of stake, which uh, will make Ethereum scalable. So what are your current uh, expectations uh, from Ethereum merge? I think the Ethereum merge is going to happen. Um, you know, I'm hesitant. <laughs> I don't want to jinx it, right? Um, but, you know, it seems to me like all of the preconditions have been met at this point. Um, and so, you know, I would kind of say um, my expectation is it's more likely than not that the merge happens on time. Um, it would take something, you know, a significant uh, issue, which look, we've had significant issues before in the past, it, it's crypto, uh, but it would take something pretty significant and unknown, um, you know, uh, problem to arise now um, in the next month to derail the merge at this point. So I'm pretty confident that it will happen. Um, but I do think that outside of the merge, you know, the merge doesn't necessarily give us um, kind of immediately, um, and this is a selfish kind of, you know, as, as a smart contract platform, the merge doesn't give us that much, right? Um, you know, it gives us better uh, kind of issuance and, and better security and things like that. But in terms of like practical improvements for like throughput and scalability, it doesn't do that much for us. Um, I think uh, things like EIP 4844 are much more beneficial. Um, so, you know, post-merge um, mm -hmm. in the next hard fork, if we can get, um, you know, the, the 
initial kind of version of sharding done, I think that will be a huge win for the entire the Ethereum ecosystem because you know it'll reduce roll up transaction costs by you know fifty x maybe or, mm -hmm. or even more. Yeah, let's see how it evolves. And as well, uh, recently in your another interview, you, uh, you have been talking about the new metric in town of uh, the back of the fee to stake a search synthetics has seen lately. And uh, can you tell uh, more about this and uh, why crypto fees are the new meme metric? Yeah, I think, you know, you always need some uh, scoreboard, right, to track um, who's who's doing well and, you know, um, what new projects are, are kind of emerging as dominant. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, realistically, um, that uh, it's, um, it's, you know, getting closer to a point now where we have uh, sustainable metrics. Right. Um, for a long time, you know, TVL was kind of the dominant metric. I think mm -hmm. we've now gone to a point where there's su sufficient usage um, and sufficient users paying for access to DeFi platforms and, and other platforms that we can start to track, you know, usage and revenue as like the key metric. Um, I actually spoke to David um, from CryptoFees uh, today, and, you know, I'm super excited for some of the things that they're planning um, to, to kind of, you know, improve the side and, and you know, make it more usable. Um, so I think it's only going to get better as, as you know, we kind of uh, hone down on exactly what um, fee revenue looks like and, and how to measure it properly. So it's it's very exciting. Yeah, and recently you even overcame Bitcoin in in the fees. <laughs> yeah, for a few days. Um, so I think you know the interesting thing with synthetics, um, as always, is you know it's uh, a kind of this iterative process of like testing. Um, you know, different parameters and trying to optimize parameters. Um, and so, you know, as we've kind of uh, played around with different parameters to try and like get the optimal uh, fee yield and, and, you know, lower the risk for stakers, um, the volumes have gone up and then they've kind of gone down and gone back up again. Um, I think we will get to a point, hopefully in the next month, where um, with a couple of the new um, uh, SIPs that are being launched, uh, we'll be able to get the fee, uh, the fees for atomic swaps down again to a level so that we can get, you know, hopefully a million dollars a day of fees, um, you know, through the protocol. Um, so, you know, there's still a bit of work to be done and, and it's not quite done, um, but we're getting much closer. Yeah, and uh, as well, uh, in our last interview a year ago, you mentioned that uh, you plan to release uh, uh, V3, version 3 of synthetics by the end of the year, uh, but uh, that didn't happen. And what was the reason for the delay and when it is planned to release and uh, what we uh, can we look forward to in the V3? Did I actually say which year I, I meant by the end? Of yeah, the, yeah. You mentioned something yeah. like by the end of the year. Well, I'm a big liar, so there you go. Um, look, I think um, I think what happened with V3 last year is we were um, we'd made pretty significant progress um, from like July through until like August. So I think. Um, you know, we we did that interview at ECC, if I remember correctly. Um, and so, you know, through July and August, we'd had um, really good progress on the architecture of V3. And the plan was to try and uh, deprecate um, V2X, like to, to shut down the scope um, within a few months. Unfortunately, what ended up happening um, is I think we've added something on the order of like 80 uh, SIPs, AD improvement mm -hmm. proposals since then. So basically what happened is we thought we we're going to be able to shut down V2 uh, much, much sooner than we were able to. Um, and in the end, there was a whole bunch more work uh, that we weren't expecting. Um, and so that just pushed out V3 because, you know, the resourcing for V2X was much more critical. Um, but we are getting closer. We re we're really down to like four things that need to happen for v2x now so again it's a little bit like the merge right like it keeps getting pushed back and pushed back but i feel like we're now close enough where we can genuinely say uh that v2x will be shut down like in the next few months so what uh what new features will we see in v3 uh, how will it be different from v2 i think there's not too much in the initial version that is like from an end user perspective um hugely novel right um in the initial version it's going to be a significant improvement of a bunch of kind of annoying uh friction points that the existing system has um it's going to be later on that we start adding things like permissionless assets and and you know 
um, a bunch of new features, but the initial version of V3 is really about removing uh, some of the pain points of the existing system. So, um, you know, not having to claim every week, um, you know, the way that fees are distributed, uh, the way that, you know, um, inflation is calculated, like there's a whole bunch of small changes that need to be made. Mm -hmm. um, and then the architecture itself is completely rewritten from scratch um, because the contracts that were running for synthetics, some of them are four years old. Um, you know, the, I think the, like the oldest versions like running on like version four of Solidity, right? So um, they're just very legacy, uh, you know, contracts and, and the code base is very legacy. So just upgrading everything to like modern um, software practices is, is going to be a big improvement as well. Okay, so we'll wait for you to see. And as we'll, well wait, we'll wait. It's, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to promise this time, but I think I think we're close there. I think we're closer than we were last year. Yeah, maybe by the end of this year. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, and you as well talk a lot about uh, problems uh, with the governance and the necessity of uh, right DAO tooling. Uh, can you elaborate on that? And can you tell more about uh, V3 GMs, the new synthetics governance model? Um, yeah, so, you know, the issue that we have, I think, in governance right now is we're too reliant on multi-sigs. Um, which is something that we've known for a long time. And while I think most projects have gotten better at how they manage their multi-sigs, at the end of the day, a multi-sig having control of contracts uh, creates this like discretionary component, right? So you imagine a scenario where you have three people who are multi-sig signers and those three people, you know, you need to get two of three of them uh, mm -hmm. to some transaction. So you need two of them to collude and be bad actors, right? And so, you know, what a lot of projects do is they go out and get, um, you know, people with good reputations in the space um, and they, you know, try and make sure that uh, they're high profile people who are signing these transactions. Um, the end result of that is you still have a situation where if the multi-sig signers decided that they didn't want to give up control of the protocol or whatever, you would have to trust them to you know, sign a transaction to, to remove themselves, right? Um, and so this creates this like discretionary component. What you actually want is the ability for all of token holders to revoke the privileges of people who are making the decisions and signing transactions. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways to do this, but we've designed a system that uh, allows for token holders to have much more granular control um, over this process. And, and we just launched our first elections um, that are controlled by V3GM. So basically the election happens, the various councils are voted in, and the system automatically grants NFTs that represent the participation on each council for each of the council members, and the system can revoke that as well. So rather than with a multi-sig where the, the signers themselves need to revoke access, now you can actually revoke access automatically through um, token holder control, basically, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a much better solution. Okay, great. And as well, talking about partnerships, uh, yesterday you announced uh, the, your partnership with OneInch, uh, which uh, will integrate um, uh, atomic uh, swaps uh, via synthetics. Uh, can you tell more about this? Yeah, I mean, this partnership with uh, with OneInch goes back a very, very long way, right? Um, you know, years. Um, you know, even uh, the early designs of Atomic Swaps, Anton um, from One Inch was, you know, kind of helping with some of the design work. So we've gone through multiple iterations to get to the, the version that we have today. Um, and even then, after going through all of those iterations and kind of improving it and getting it to a point where um, it's functional, um, on the other side, the integration needs to happen for all of the routes. Um, so one inch had integrated some of the routes, but not all of the routes. So now you have this um, situation where one inch has finally integrated all of the different routes. So you've got this multi-route system, um, which just means that if you turn up to one inch and you do a transaction, the likelihood that it will get routed through synthetics is, you know, I think five or 10 times higher now because you've got access to, to this multi-hop routing um, as opposed to a single, a single route through each transaction. Um, so we've seen that already have an impact. But as I said earlier, yeah, we're still not quite there in terms of like optimizing all the parameters. So I think when we get everything right and we have like the full one inch integration plus 
optimize parameters, plus some of the other uh, things that we're working on, um, you know, curve, uh, some tweaks to like the curve model, we're going to have, you know, volumes that are going to be 10x or even, you know, 50x what we're looking at today. Yeah, I guess it should significantly reduce the fees the user spent. And exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the idea is that you want to get, you know, the best fill possible through, um, you know, an aggregate or like one inch. So um, hopefully, um, you know, in the next few weeks, we'll have a couple of improvements that will be released and some new parameters. Um, and that'll just tighten the spreads even further.